welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Sam Hall. I'm the director of the Conservative Environment Network with the Independent Forum for Conservatives that support conservation and decarbonisation. Um, today's webinar is on the topic of environmental diplomacy in COP26, working together to protect our planet. And I'm delighted that we're joined by such a distinguished and expert panellist uh, as our speakers. And I'm very grateful to them all for making the time uh, to provide comments and expertise today. Um, in terms of format, each panellist will provide some opening remarks for five minutes. Um, I'll introduce each one of them in turn. We'll then do opening statements, which will last for the sort of first half an hour of the webinar. And then there'll be an opportunity for um, those of you listening to put your questions to the panellists uh, in the second half an hour. So do please submit your questions via the Q&A box uh, on Zoom. We'll be monitoring them uh, and, we'll, and uh, the team will be sending them through to me. And I'll try to put as many as possible uh, to our panellists. And then hopefully in the final uh, five or ten minutes, um, we'll, we'll have closing statements from each of the panellists and we'll finish promptly at 10 o'clock. Um, so I'm delighted that we're able to convene this discussion in what is a really crucial week for environmental diplomacy. Today is, of course, Earth Day and President Biden is hosting a major global climate summit for the leaders of the world's biggest emitters, who will each be encouraged to make ambitious new commitments as part of the new US administration's big diplomatic push on climate. Um, our own Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be speaking uh, and in advance of the summit, the UK this week has announced a world leading new climate target for 2035, pledging to cut emissions by 78% by 2035. This gives the UK the most ambitious near term climate target of any major economy. It will accelerate decarbonisation and bring forward new investments in clean infrastructure and green industries here in the UK, while also giving other countries confidence to increase their own ambition. And it's of course not just a big week for environmental diplomacy, but a big year. Um, the UK is hosting COP26 later this year in Glasgow, um, the most important UN climate summit since Paris in 2015. And the environment is also going to be a major theme of the UK's G7 presidency, which is also being host, uh, hosted this year. And CEN is doing some of our own environmental diplomacy of sorts this year too, in the run up to, uh, to Glasgow. We're helping to bring together conservative legislators from around the world um, to, share, uh, to share their perspectives on climate policy in their own countries and to debate and champion conservative approaches to climate change. But in today's discussion, we want to focus in on the role of diplomacy specifically in driving action on climate change. And we'll be considering the UK's international leadership role in this area. We'll be exploring how we can encourage other nations to increase their climate ambition and deliver the Paris Agreement goals. Um, we'll also be considering what countries want these summits to achieve and the impact of renewed American climate leadership on environmental diplomacy, as well as gaining an insight into the role of ambassadors and diplomatic missions in tackling environmental issues. Um, so we've got lots to discuss and without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. So His Excellency, the Honourable George Brandis QC, is Australian High Commissioner to the UK. Uh, a barrister by profession, he served as a Senator in the Australian Parliament for 18 years. He was a Minister in the governments of John Howard, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull. Um, unfortunately, the High Commissioner has to leave half an hour earlier today in order to attend a meeting with uh, an Australian Government Minister who's attending uh, the UK today. Um, but we're very grateful that you're able to join us today, uh, High Commissioner. Um, I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sam, and thank you to the Conservative Environment Network for the opportunity to speak at this most timely webinar. Later today, Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, will join Prime Minister Johnson and other world leaders at President Biden's Climate Summit, where he will affirm Australia's ambition for a cleaner, greener world. Australia will always play an ambitious role in global climate action. As recently as last Monday evening, Prime Minister Morrison reiterated in a major speech to the Business Council of Australia but the Australian government is resolutely committed to getting to net zero as soon as possible and doing so preferably by 2050. In making our ambition clear, Australia intends to work closely and vigorously with partners at home and abroad to turn this ambition into practical action. While we must always be honest that achieving deep decarbonisation across our economies will be challenging. There are also significant opportunities to be tapped. Both the United Kingdom and Australia know that practical, scalable 
and technology-based solutions will substantially cut our emissions and significantly increase economic opportunity. Now, technology is, of course, not an answer in and of itself. And we need to get the right policy settings in place to drive solutions. But as liberal market economies, we know that punitive taxation and unduly burdensome regulation are not the drivers of uptake. Rather, strategic investment and genuine private sector partnerships are the best way to transform our economies commercially. Australia's aspirations are not based on theory. They're grounded in our experience as a world leader in transitioning away from carbon intensive technologies, technologies to lower emissions alternatives. We've found significant success through adopting two enduring principles for our energy transition. First, we take a strategic view of investment and ensure public money leverages private action at each point along the innovation chain. Secondly, we always target the removal of the green premium first and foremost, ensuring that we are always working towards ensuring low emissions technologies ultimately attract a green discount to supercharge their uptake. When you put those two principles into action, as Australia has found, you get results. Australians inv Australia's investments are now turning every dollar of public money invested into $2.50 of leveraged private sector finance, amplifying the work of our world leading Green Bank. Australia has obliterated the green premium on solar and wind, ensuring these climate responsible technologies are now the most economically effective deployments a firm or a family can make. And it's no wonder that in 2019, Australia deployed new renewable energy 10 times faster per capita than the global average. Australians, Australia's emissions are now 19% below 2005 levels, beating not only the OECD average, but comparable nations like Canada and New Zealand, all the while growing our population, our exports and our economy. So when we look ahead to the challenges of tomorrow, we need to be instructed and to embrace the successes of the past. If we can produce green hydrogen, green steel and green aluminium cost effectively, whilst also storing energy, sequestering carbon and more effectively measuring the impacts of soil sequestration, we can offer a cost effective pathway to slashing emissions in the sectors that account for 90% of global emissions. Meeting our ambitious goals will take all countries doing their fair share. In Australia, we're investing at home and partnering abroad to hasten new and emerging technologies down the cost curve through co-investment between government and industry. We've previously announced that the Australian government will directly invest at least 18 billion Australian dollars over the next decade in domestic climate action to mobilise a further $50 billion in private sector finance, which will also create 130,000 jobs. Additionally, today, I'm particularly pleased to be able to tell you of a new measure by the Australian Government, which was announced in Canberra overnight, and which Prime Minister Morrison will take to President Biden, Biden's summit today. The Australian government has decided to invest an initial amount of $565.8 million to establish a global climate action, clean energy supply chain through what we now call low emissions technology partnerships. We will ink these ambitious wide ranging deals with our key trading and strategic partners to bring a global focus to technology deployment 
ensuring that we're amplifying our efforts and leveraging a further three to five dollars for every public dollar we invest. As part of that effort, I could also announce this morning that Australia has identified the United Kingdom as one of the first group of countries which we will invite to join us in a low emissions technology partnership. Put simply, the time for a debate of if or why has ended. The job ahead for us all is to turn 2021 into a year we make a global plan for how we commercially transform our economies to achieve net zero emissions. With the right investments and a spirit of global cooperation, a net zero future is within our reach. And in that effort, know that Australia is your resolute partner in making a success of the most tr momentous transition through which we are now living. Thank you. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, and it's fantastic that you're able to share the news of the new low emission technology partnerships uh, with us today, and particularly the, the cooperation between the UK and Australia that um, is going to be uh, prioritised in the, in the first phase. So, yeah, that, that's excellent news. Um, I'd now like to turn to our, our second speaker, um, Her Excellency Dr. Farah Faisal. Um, uh, she's the High Commissioner of the Maldives, the UK, as well as a non-resident ambassador of the Maldives to France and Ireland. And she's also served as the spokesperson in Europe for the Maldivian Democratic Party. Um, Dr. Farah Faisal, over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I would like to say thank you to the Conservative Environment Network for this opportunity. Um, I am delighted uh, to be in the presence of this distinguished panel. And of course, the topic is one that is at the heart of our survival as an island nation. Um, you know, uh, um, for Maldives, uh, when we talk about climate change and, and dealing with it, um, uh, it's not an, something that can happen you know, tomorrow because it's actually something that is happening right now. And uh, it's, it's something that we cannot wait for other people to do something about it. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Maldives is doing what it can as a small island developing country uh, uh, to ensure that uh, our message gets across and something is done by the rest of the world. I mean, um, for example, um, uh, when it comes to small island developing states, Maldives, uh, as a founder member of the IOSIS, has been a strong voice uh, with regards to the adverse impacts uh, faced by the SIDS due to climate change and, and also sea level right since the Rio Earth Summit. Um, today, of course, um, IOC uh, plays a leading role uh, in raising awareness of climate change on the international stage and advocating for strong climate action. Um, uh, we, you, despite the heterogeneity of, of the IOC, um, it has succeeded in building a common diplomatic discourse and influencing strategy and mobilized uh, political leaders as well as talented uh, negotiators and advisors. Um, Maldives, you know, uh, uh, we've always defended and voiced the particular vulnerabilities of small island nations, uh, especially with regard to the low-lying nature, the geographical and the socioeconomic vulnerabilities. I mean, for Maldives, you know, uh, we are a nation that's uh, uh, an average is, is less than two meters above sea level. Um, uh, and to this end, uh, uh, a preferential treatment of small island states that are particularly vulnerable to these threats has always been uh, one of the main uh, climate policies of the Maldivian government. Um, uh, 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 and, and talking of IOCs, I mean, during the negotiation of the Paris Climate Agreement, and with support from other members, uh, Maldives succeeded to secure a uh, special circumstances as vulnerable countries and, and uh, demonstrated leadership in raising the ambition to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to help secure an ambitious long-term temperature goal of limiting global warming to below 1.5. Um, we are also a member of the uh, Commonwealth, uh, sorry, uh, um, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, the CVF, which is chaired by Bangladesh at the moment. I mean, CVF was, uh, uh, CVF started actually in the Maldives, and uh, which is now setting uh, out to the world, not just a new approach, 
uh, uh, but a new paradigm, I would say, in, in how to deal with the challenge of climate emergency. Uh, uh, this new uh, paradigm, uh, it's called the Climate Prosperity Agenda, uh, um, is, is the um, uh, is what cuts the Gordian knot that has always held back uh, uh, progress on climate mitigation, that of the apparent uh, uh, contradiction between the need for economic growth and the need for emission reductions, not just by percentages, you know, uh, but right down to zero. Um, we have uh, also, uh, um, you know, as I said, uh, we can't wait. So we've done what we can and we are going ahead with that. You know, we have declared our intention to reach net zero by 2030. Of course, these things are uh, dependent on support, both technological and financial from our development partners. Um, along with this high ambition in our NDC, we are committed and already doing the work to ensure that resilience and adaptation are at the heart of all our plans. And in this sense, uh, uh, we are in the process of formulating policies, uh, legal and regulatory frameworks to realize these ambitious targets and to ensure our people survive and thrive in the context of a future where our vulnerabilities are expected to exacerbate given the trajectory of the increase in global temperature. As such, uh, uh, in the Maldives, a climate emergency bill is getting finalized in the parliament and the process of mainstreaming climate change and resilience into the main sectors of our economy is well underway. Um, the government has also pledged to designate at least one reef, one mangrove and one uninhabited island in each of the 20 atolls of the Maldives as protected areas. And we are also doing uh, you know, research. Uh, um, we are asking the world to come and do their research in the Maldives you know, on things like uh, accelerated coral growth. Because these, as coralline islands, these things are uh, you know, uh, crucial for our survival. Um, we are designating entire atolls as UNESCO biosphere reserves to model um, an effective and sustainable management system for a tall ecosystem, conservation and sustainable development. Um, we also have a green, and as you know, tourism is, is, is a big industry, but we have a tourist green tax. It's earmarked for the Maldives Green Fund and is used exclusively to fund environmental initiative. Um, many of our ongoing uh, initiatives, such as the Climate Smart Resilient Island Initiative, launched by the President, um, his Excellency Ibrahim Mohamed Soli at the UN Climate Action Summit in 2019 are introduced as a way to increase our resilience and reduce vulnerabilities. The upcoming <clears throat> COP26, I mean, what do we want from that? I mean, we believe that it is important that we all have refocused our priorities based on what we have learned from the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, especially to pay closer environment, uh, attention to the environment while rebuilding our economies by giving emphasis on green recovery. We want to use this pandemic as an opportunity to do that. Um, Maldivians, uh, you know, by nature are very optimistic people. You know, so we, we, we refuse to believe that, you know, uh, uh, that Maldives is not going to exist uh, at some point in the near future. So we want to use every opportunity to do what we can to survive. Um, and in the COP26, we have to finish the Paris rule book by completing the unfinished businesses from the outstanding works since the adoption of the agreement to kickstart the full implementation of the agreement without any delays. Um, developing, uh, developed nations need to fulfill their pledges and obligations, you know, simple as that, they have to do that to mobilize the US dollars um, 100 billion annually by 2020. The truth is that um, we are still far behind this goal. Um, in the COP, we also need to agree on scaling up finances and extend support to developing countries, vulnerable countries, to meet the Paris Agreement targets. I mean, climate finance, it, it, 
I mean, I get the opportunity to talk about the climate, uh, you know, change issue and the Maldives quite often. And one thing that really frustrates us is access to climate finance. I mean, we hear so many times, you know, uh, larger countries pledging, uh, you know, certain numbers, large amounts of money, allocating them to, you know, help uh, uh, in developing countries, vulnerable countries, uh, of, uh, to meet their targets, you know, to, to transform their economies. Uh, we have multilateral organizations doing the same thing. Uh, this, you know, green fund, that fund. The problem for us small states, the biggest challenge we face at the moment is access to climate finance. I mean, I, I, people must be tired of me, you know, hearing uh, me say this, but we seem to need a PhD in trying to access climate finance. So, so I think these are the things we would like to see changed uh, going forward. Um, and um, one thing, if you ask me uh, what Maldives want to see is for the UK and the other larger states, it would be this. We want them to walk the talk. Uh, when they talk about dealing with climate change and the protection of our oceans, of sustainability, we want them to deliver. At the moment, um, we are slightly disappointed. I'm slightly disappointed to say that there is sometimes a disconnect between what um, larger state, states say publicly and what they actually do, especially when it comes to smaller states and bypassing our interest. I hope this changes soon. And as High Commissioner, um, uh, how do I use my role to promote climate action? Continuously make noise. Maldives may be small, but we cannot give up. I am sometimes asked, you know, if we are really experiencing climate change, the, the effects of climate change in the Maldives. You know, people ask me, um, you know, isn't beach erosion a natural process? You know, isn't it a seasonal thing? It's always happened. And yes, it is a seasonal process in the Maldives. You know, uh, 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 we have beach erosion at certain times of the year and other times, you know, we, we get the beach back, you know. But I say this to them. It's a bit like the seasons here, you know, uh, uh, in autumn, the leaves fall and uh, the trees, trees are bare, but nobody blinks, because nobody's worried because they know come spring, the trees will be you know, full of flowers and, 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 and it will bloom. So nobody talks about it because nobody's worried about it because everybody knows it happens. But what if one year the leaves, the flowers don't come back? And that is what we are seeing in the Maldives because some of our beaches have not come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, High Commissioner, for providing um, yeah, a, a fascinating perspective from obviously a country that's really on, on the front line of climate change and is a critical voice in, in this environmental diplomacy. Um, I, I'm going to turn now to our third speaker, um, who's Stanley Johnson. Stanley is SEN's international ambassador. Uh, he's the former Conservative MEP and Vice Chairman of the European Parliament's Committee on the Environment and Public Health, a former senior official at the European Commission and a long-standing environmental campaigner. Um, Stanley, uh, over to you. Thank you for joining us. Stanley, you'll need to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies for that. There thank we go. Very much. Hey, thank you, James, for that introduction I've been thinking about. Earth Day, I remember way back in 1970 when I was the environmental officer of the Conservative Research Department, the first actually. I, well, I was sent by the Tories, imaginably, to go to New York. And I walked in the streets of New York on April the 22nd. I think this was organized by Senator Gaylord Nelson. And I had a sense then, you know, that we were on an environmental wave. And in a sense, in a sense we were, because 1970 led to the first World Congress in 1972 in June. But actually, as you all know, the, the climate change issue as such was not a big deal there insofar as Stockholm dealt with climate. It was in the context of whether supersonic transports would damage the ozone layer. So it's taken a long time for this, this subject to really hit the headlines. And going back again, if, if I may, because I want to make a point about the science, the breakthrough really did come 
in um, October 1986 when the WHO, sorry, the WMO, and um, ULEP jointly organized the first meeting of the IPCC, which I had the honor of going to as the, as the European Commission's delegate. Now, you could say, okay, that's 30 years it took between you know, establishing the IPCC and Paris um, 2015. Okay, you could say we're on another environmental wave of, of interest and concern at the moment. But I would like to make two points, which I think are very, very important to maintaining the trajectory which we are almost on. We're not really on it because everybody knows that the if you add up the NDCs, you don't actually get to 1.5. You more like get to two, you may even get to three. We're not really on the right trajectory, but nevertheless, the political will is there. Now, the point I want to make is political will, and you're going to see it today in the, in the summit, that's a pretty fragile thing. And the underpinning of political will, and Harriet's Harry, Harry there, is, of course, in a de democratic society, the willingness of MPs to do what the government asks them to do, and the willingness of the government to put forward measures for MPs to to support. So political will, I think, is absolutely vital. And I would say there are two ingredients which we, we must not forget. First is the science. Pick up today's Times. Okay, there's a lead, there's a lead op-ed in today's Times giving space to some professor, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the paper in front of me now, who really says, well, you know, the science isn't really clear about global warming. You know, we've got to be very careful. Well, honestly, um, the thing is this, there are a lot of people out there who are still ready to listen I'm not saying they're all called Nigel Lawson, obviously, um, but you know he did, he did for a long time. The BBC would give Nigel Lawson time as part of the balanced debate. So first thing it is, we've got to be absolutely sure that the science, that our attention on the science is crucial, and we and, and those reports from IPCC come out and they are paid attention to. Secondly, I'm thinking about the young, and I think about public opinion as a whole. What really swung the debate over the last uh, few years? is being people like Greta Thunberg. No, for my mind, there's no question about it. And we need to, as it were, capitalize on that. And we need, I think, to build more effort with the, with the young. Uh, as I say, politics is fickle. And if the politicians of today sense that the public isn't with them, you know, even this great you know, consensus where we seem to be building may fall apart. One thing we need to get across also, I think, is that the costs of climate change, of dealing with climate change, are relatively unimportant. If you think, if you think that in the last year, this country alone has mobilized 400 billion pounds uh, to deal with COVID, and here we all are, here we are, just a nation of 60 million people. How, what a relatively small amount of money do we need, really? Look at what did, what did Paris ask? Paris asked for 100 billion US dollars a year. Well, see that in the context of what we've just been able to raise for COVID and see how climate change is existentially far more important than COVID ever was. So in my um, thinking forward now, I say, yes, we've got to get a good deal out of, of Glasgow, that's obvious. We above all must link the biodiversity aspect into the climate change aspect now. And that's why I think we should also begin to concentrate on the Kunming meeting. We don't yet know when Kunming, which is the CBD meeting, is going to be, but it is very important. Nature-based solutions probably are going to produce 30% of the as you put, net effect we, we need. So, Sam, I don't want to go on because I know you're very pushed for time. A, a very good idea to have this. The Conservatives have a, have a view on this. I think that they will, above all, be pushing now for charges, the carbon charges. Above all, carbon border taxes. It's perfectly obvious that you won't necessarily get the top-down solutions, but you can get the bottom-up solutions, which come from effective charging systems. And I think you'll find very soon, if countries like China realize that their exports are going to be penalized because they're doing low-cost low production, energy, wasteful production, they will soon, as it were, realize that they have to not be free riders in this whole important game. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening.
Brilliant, thank you, Stanley. And yeah, great to have that collective memory going back so many years of previous um, previous summits and environmental negotiations. I'm conscious that um, the Australian High Commissioner now has to to leave us as it's it is half past. If before you go, High Commissioner, if I could put one of the questions in the chat box to you very briefly, so that you get a chance for to some of the dialogue. One of the questions we've had is that uh, Australia obviously has lots of solar energy, lots of kind of natural resources in terms of that particular renewable energy. Why the question is asking why isn't Australia doing more and being more of a leader in this area? Well, I think the premise of the question is entirely wrong. Um, particularly domestic solar energy. Um, uh, almost half of Australian households now are powered by uh, rooftop arrays on, on, on dwelling houses. So uh, in terms of per capita take up of solar energy in particular, because we, as your question rightly says, we do have a lot of solar energy. Australia is in fact the world leader. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, High Commissioner. I'm, I'm sorry. That, uh, I'm so sorry. I, I had to more of a discussion. <laughs> but uh, very good to see you all. Goodbye. No, we understand. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time and for joining us. Um, right. So we'll, we'll move on now to our, our fourth panellist, um, Harriet Baldwin, MP. Um, Harriet was elected as the MP for West uh, Worcestershire in 2010. She's a member of the Treasury Select Committee, chair of the British Group Interparliamentary Union and represents the UK on the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Um, Harry was also um, previously the Minister for Africa and uh, the Economic Secretary to the Treasury. Um, Harriet, thank you so much for joining us and uh, I'll hand over to you now. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. And thanks for having me on your amazing panel on this incredibly important day. And uh, I, I just want to share um, from the point of view of a, a, a UK parliamentarian, but also someone who's been a former minister, just how important uh, this issue now is not only um, within the UK, but also as part of our international diplomatic work. And certainly uh, when I had the privilege of being a joint foreign office and DFID minister uh, before the merger, it was something that uh, became increasingly a priority, particularly after the decision was taken um, to host uh, this year's uh, conference of the parties in Glasgow. And so the diplomatic network, I think you can see, has, uh, has shifted its focus, much more of an emphasis across the diplomatic network, uh, not only in terms of making the conference itself a success, but also in terms of making sure that the UK uh, is able to show uh, some of the things that we're doing um, and leaving by example. And I'm very reassured to see the quality of some of the diplomatic appointments that have been made um, uh, in terms of, uh, of climate. And I'm sure that, uh, uh, Dr. Faisal, you've, you've come across some of the amazing people that we have working on this. And we were in the process of increasing that specialization across the uh, diplomatic network when I left government and I'm sure that that's continued um, since then and I think there are really three ways in which uh, the UK um, is uh, in terms of this diplomatic initiative uh, trying to uh, move forward the momentum across nations um, one is through this international diplomatic network um, but uh, the second one that I wanted to highlight um, was the importance of leading by example. So the legislation that the UK put through on a cross-party basis to legislate for net zero, um, being the first of the G20 economies to do that, I think it showed what is possible and what can be done um, when a democracy gets behind it. And secondly, um, the, the uh, in, important emphasis that we've put um, across, uh, across the world in terms of other initiatives like power in past coal, but also demonstrate through our investments in uh, offshore wind and in terms of solar power, um, how you can uh, really power past coal in a way that is good for consumers, good for the climate um, and good for the economy in terms of creating green jobs. And there's been a really strong narrative around that domestically, which is something that I think you can then take into your international diplomatic work to show uh, and, and it's something I passionately tried to achieve when I was um, in, in the role was uh, to make countries across Africa as excited to discover that they've got access to very good sources of wind and, and solar power as they are when they discover oil and gas offshore. And I think, you know, that's something that um, increasingly is happening. But I think UK businesses still have a huge opportunity there um, that is um, out there and that they uh, could take fuller advantage of. And then the 
third point I wanted to make, um, uh, as a member of the Treasury Select Committee, we've published a report today on decarbonisation and green finance. And we heard from Dr Faisal just how important the financing aspect of this is. And I think this is something that the UK, you know, truly is leading on and can um, uh, make even more of, which is the uh, fundraising through green financial um, and initiatives like the, the Green Guilt we're going to have this year, but the moves that we're making in terms of um, trying to make it easier for pension investors to uh, invest in clean growth uh, and uh, making that clear through the, some of the passive indices, some of the measures that the Bank of England are taking, the regulators are taking to make that easier. Because I think that uh, actually at the end of the day, as we heard in the, um, the High Commissioner's words, you know, it's the, the financing aspect of this is going to be all important. And here I think you know, the UK truly has the potential uh, to crowd in the range of private sector financial initiatives that are going to be needed and so I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to that report that we've published today as a Treasury Committee. Thanks very much. Thanks very much Harriet for those, those opening remarks and for your reflections on your time uh, as African Minister in particular. Um, uh, we'll move on now to um, our final speaker James Cameron. Um, James is a prominent thought leader and practitioner in the global climate change movement um, and as his career has spanned senior roles in finance, law and, and more besides. Um, James is a London Sustainable Development Commissioner, a friend of COP26 uh, and was an advisor to the presidencies of COP22 and COP23. Um, he participated in negotiating the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol as an advisor to the Alliance of Small Island States. Um, previously, he was also chair of the Overseas Development Institute and chairman of Climate Change Capital. Um, so James, an impressive CV, um, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Sam, and uh, good morning, everybody. And Yes, long history in this subject, tried many ways of dealing with it, uh, law, policy, finance, entrepreneurship. And uh, it was lovely to hear uh, Dr. Faisal talk about uh, how AOSIS had in some sense changed the language of diplomacy. And that was our intention when we, when we created AOSIS all those years ago. It was to bring a voice of the most vulnerable to the negotiations, those with most to lose and with the least possible economic and political power, who really only had the law that they could turn to in order to protect themselves from, their, from, from the fate uh, of climate change. But in fact, what was most interesting about the effect of building that coalition and changing the political discourse in diplomacy is that the arguments made by AOSIS are the arguments in the interests of, our, of us all. Uh, the most vulnerable uh, have the best arguments uh, to be made for all of us. Had we adopted the uh, agreement that the AOSIS group put forward in, gosh, it, it was February 91, was the first time the negotiating group formed before the agreement the following year in Rio. AOSIS put forward an agreement, fully fledged, worked out, top to bottom. Had we adopted that then, we would be, all of us, would be in a much better position now. We would be living safer lives and our prosperity would be more obviously uh, safeguarded. So that's, in my view, the right way to look at the diplomatic situation that we are in. And I'm pleased to say that the UK presidency through Alok Sharma it is fully aware that this process has to be uh, a collaborative process. So we have themes, good themes for our presidency, important themes on nature. Uh, Stanley made that point, which we might want to develop a bit, a bit more because it's critical and it has, has been neglected so far as a strategy for dealing with climate change, but obviously for other biodiversity and natural systems that we need to uh, nourish and, and, and conserve and protect. Uh, finance, we have mentioned already, critically important, part of the political bargain in the negotiations, but also obviously part of the solution. So we should be constantly thinking about how do we make capital flow away from further risk and towards opportunity associated with solving the problem. That should be a, a critical diplomatic uh, angle uh, in, in these negotiations and transport and energy are perhaps more obvious and we are making progress on those fronts but perhaps it's worth just for the audience sake understanding that these 
very slow, COP26 article, count the numbers. You know, I've been doing this for over 30 years. It's a slow process and it can be maddingly so. Very bureaucratic in some respects. But around the formal negotiations, each year there is a gathering of interests, including investors and innovators and civil society organisations who can get together and move forward their own sense of what the answer might be and, and build their own cooperative networks. And this year, who knows exactly how we're going to do that. We might have to do it digitally. But that is a part of this process. And it's part of the diplomatic process too, to enable it to take place more effectively. And we do that through the climate champion uh, that is, has this particular outward facing role, which balances the sort of inward detailed negotiations on the rule book and the various particulars uh, that we can go into if people want to know about. So it seems to me that not only is the role of law central for fairness, but also for market structuring and creating market opportunities for capital to be deployed. Not only is the AOSIS case the right one for them and for those who want to see a fair and just solution arising out of this crisis, but it's also in our interests. Their voice is actually one that we ought to be listening to for our own benefit. And the diplomatic process has got to move away from the notion that there's some zero sum game here. There is not an I win, you lose negotiating strategy that will ever work here. Uh, that just isn't going to be satisfactory. We have to build uh, sovereign to sovereign collaboration. And even that's not going to be enough because we'll need to bring in the real world sources of power in finance, in technology innovation, uh, in business association, in the way we trade with each other, where governments are significantly important, but by no means the, the, the full range of powers that we have to solve this problem. So again, ask yourself, what's the diplomacy for? The diplomacy is in order to build a better collaborative framework from which laws can be put in place, a variety of them, not all the same. The Paris Agreement envisaged contributions made by countries in their own political economy, not the same top-down formula which previously I favoured when negotiating the Kyoto Protocol. We don't have that now. It works the other way around. That diversity might actually be a strength. But in sum, each and every intervention made by governments in their own political economy has got to incentivize the kind of innovation that we need to solve this problem has got to build the collaborative networks and make them effective and, and ultimately give expression to the, the, the movement that Stanley referred to before. Because after all, there is a strong intergenerational fairness and equity point governing these negotiations. And if we miss that, we won't be sufficiently ambitious and we'll lose the energy associated with that political movement. And finally, a point that I, I think uh, Harriet was willing to as well. Uh, at some stage, a connection has got to be made between this intergovernmental process happening, hopefully, in real life and not just digital life at the end of the year, and people's ordinary everyday experience living in this country. Every presidency must do that. They must make a connection between this global process, which can seem very abstract and remote, and people's everyday ordinary experience of living, particularly now post-COVID. So I see it as an obligation on all of us who know something about this issue to help uh, Harriet and her peers, whichever party they come from, to explain why this matters to their constituents and to reinterpret their everyday concerns in the light of climate change. What does it matter to housing and transport and green spaces wherever they live or the, the agricultural economy they're a part of? Where's the connection? Why does it matter to me? And we need to make that good this year, otherwise our global diplomatic efforts will not be sufficiently matched by our domestic political efforts. Thank you very much, James, that incredibly useful over, overview of the dynamics of some of these summits and then bringing it down to the, the, the very um, domestic and, and how politicians can engage their own, their own communities and, and publics, um, which I think is a really crucial aspect in this. Um, so we're now going to go into the question and answer session. We've got um, uh, 
quarter of an hour, so not, not very long at all. Um, but please do keep submitting your questions and we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, I had a, a few quick questions for, for each of the panellists, um, if I may, before we, we come on to audience ones. Um, Harriet, if I might start with you. Um, obviously, recently, as you referenced in your remarks, um, the government's merged the, the, the Foreign Commonwealth Office with DFID. Um, do you think that has made it easier um, to um, do climate diplomacy and, and that diplomats can back up their, their arse and their messages with, with offers of, of finance or um, has, it, has it made it difficult or made the aid giving less effective? And I guess more broadly around that, do you think there is now a kind of a single thread running through our, our international engagement, engagement of climate and that we're not, this is now kind of properly embedded as a priority for the, for the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office? Uh, well, as I said at the time, I, I personally um, didn't think that it was something that needed to happen because as a joint minister, um, uh, we were already doing that. And when you go to post, you, you don't see, you know, one department of Whitehall and another department of Whitehall. You just see UK uh, diplomatic uh, and development efforts. So, uh, you know, on the ground, it was already happening. Um, but, um, you know, nevertheless, I don't particularly object to it and joining it up is, is not a problem. What I do have a problem with is us breaking our manifesto commitment to 0.7. And if there were a vote on that, obviously, I would vote against it. Um, I think that the climate finance aspect of, uh, of the budget uh, seems to be, you know, largely um, intact and in fact increased to about 11.5 a billion pounds. Um, of course, the worry there is, you know, what else is being reduced? Um, you know, that we, we, we've got all that publicity around uh, Yemen and humanitarian assistance in Yemen um, uh, to, in order to accommodate that climate finance. And then the other point that used to frustrate me a, a little bit uh, as a minister is that we do put in uh, a lot of this money, for example, into the Green Climate Fund, you know, what, something like 1.4 billion pounds. Of course, when it comes out the other end in terms of a, 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 an investment from the Green Climate Fund, uh, we don't have any um, UK sort of connection to the people who benefit. They don't necessarily realise that that's coming from the UK. And I think we could have amplified our soft power even more by making more of that connection. But um, uh, I don't think the merger itself is the problem, but I do think, you know, the budget uh, does worry me. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, if I might come to um, Dr. Faisal now um, for, for a question. Um, you referenced the importance of, of climate finance in your comments to the, um, you know, to, to, to delivering on the Paris Agreement goals. How confident are you that um, the developed world is going to step up and, and deliver on their commitments at, at Glasgow? And, and you know, what will be your message for the, the UK presidency on how it can go about um, driving, driving more finance and, and hitting that goal? I, I think the issue is actually not the, not just the um, you know uh, uh, the larger countries like the UK uh, you know donating to these funds. I think for us small states is as I said access to the finance. But um, if I may digress a little bit, I see a question uh, on the chat log about are we personally prepared to fly less, eat, eat less meat and dairy, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Talking of food. I think one thing that the developed countries like the UK must do is to support sustainable production of food. And, and in case of the Maldives, it's very much fish. Now, Maldivian tuna is caught one by one. We don't use uh, nets. We don't use, uh, you know, um, troll, trolling. We don't use things like... Uh, um, per saying, we don't lease our EEZ out to uh, other countries. So every single tuna is sustainable. It's caught one by one because they don't catch anything else. There's zero discard. And at the moment, UK is slapping a 20% tax on our tuna, while other countries who don't use sustainable methods and you know things like long lining, which you can catch a lot of journals, get access to UK market for zero tariff. Now, you might ask, you know, uh, why is that? Because Maldives is a small country and we're not part of a bigger trading block. So however much I make noise, I don't have the political cloud of a large trading block that would uh, convince the UK government not to penalize us. So uh, when we talk about things, I think it is these kind of things that we want governments to do. So make sure that whatever trade you do, that it is sustainable. Because when we talk about oceans in the Maldives, 
we don't differentiate between the land and the ocean. 99% of our territory is the ocean. So we have to ensure that is protected for us to survive. It's not just the islands we talked about, but we would like the UK government to actually, you know, not penalize the countries that follow sustainable practices, simple as that. So I think all these things need to come together when we talk about the environment. Thank you very much, Dr. Wadlin. It'd be good to unpack that, that trade question as well, I think, in, in, in later question. Um, Stanley, if I can come to you now, you, you mentioned in your comments about the, the need to link up um, the, the, the COP that's happening in Glasgow on, on climate change with the, the one that's happening in Kunming at some stage on, on nature. What sort of specifically would you like to see in terms of uh, bits of the, of the kind of agreement and that, that applies to both and that, that delivers sort of both on both, both of those agendas? You might need to unmute yourself as well. Um, sorry about that. There's a very practical thing, which the House of the House of Commons and the House of Lords can do almost immediately, and that is to take the Environment Bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment. I think it's coming back to the House of Lords within within a few weeks and to try to insert in that bill what's called the state of nature clause, which would in a sense parallel what happened in 2008 with the Climate Act when the target was actually put in the piece of legislation. And obviously what we're looking for as far as the environment bill is concerned is to have something which says we are committed to halting and restoring, uh, halting and aiming to reverse the loss of biodiversity by 2030. Of course, it would then be up to the Secretary of State for the Environment and various bodies to determine the metrics by which this is measured, the kind of work the Climate Change Committee does. That's a very important thing. So it's important for Britain. It could also be extremely important internationally as we prepare for Kunming. Do you see? Because where are we now? We're at a situation where the Aichi biodiversity targets have, as it were, expired. They reached the end of their useful sell-by date, which was the end of December 2020. There's a void as far as international targets. We need to get that overall go, halt and reverse by 2030 in the overall, as it were, Kunming outcome. And one of the ways this country can be effective and I think we should also make sure the EU follows us on this is by saying look we've legislated at home for precisely that outcome now is the time to get an international agreement along the same lines thank you. Thanks Danny um, and James if I can lastly come to you and um, I would like to pick up on, on that the point that, that Dr Faisal was making about um, about trade um, and uh, also yeah, want to kind of hone in on the border carbon adjustments issue which we yeah. know a number of developed countries are, are keen to, to push on not least the, the EU and potentially potentially the US um, what do you think the impact will be on on sort of di climate diplomacy or of a measure like that which we know is, is deeply unpopular with with some developing countries and is sort of seen as advanced economy and um, protectionism yeah, this is a very tricky space. The, the, the relationship between trade and environment, the systems for regulating trade and the, the, the diplomatic system we've been discussing about climate, they're, they're not integrated. They don't operate smoothly together. And we're going to put a, we have to put a huge amount of it, particularly now that we're out of the EU and we're responsible for our own trade negotiations. We're going to have to get really good at finding this balance between trade and environment. So whilst it's a sensible idea to have a price for carbon, and you can pick that up in many different ways. Uh, equally, it makes sense to, to, to make sure that your, those you compete with in trading terms also have a price for carbon, uh, that there is some fairness in your trade relations. If country X does not regulate greenhouse gas emissions, one atmosphere, uh, they're effectively uh, causing harm to another country and they're effectively subsidizing their own industry. Right? And that's, that needs to be worked out. And the border tax adjustment is one of the ways to do that. It can be done in a non-discriminatory way. So you're not favoring your domestic production versus the other, but you're figuring out how to get some equalizing balance. The problem is it can also be abused. 
um, it can also be used for unfair protectionism. It can also make no sense at all, like in the situation of, uh, in the Maldives. And so we have to have good systems for figuring out how to make the balance. We need the WTO to be more robust, frankly, better invested in as an institution has been rather neglected in recent times. Uh, the new leadership under Ngozi is very good, and so let's hope that can be made more effective. The other thing, just worth mentioning in this context, is that we, we sometimes struggle to implement these big agreements, right? And we know that they're important for the whole world to gather together. That's what we're going to do at, at COP26, hopefully, and make some progress on, on ambition. But sometimes it's easier to have smaller agreements amongst a club of countries. I happen to think we should do something like that on nature where we can be very clear about how we value nature and how we finance the valuation of nature. But as soon as you form a club, you create rules and boundaries, which in turn creates some trade distortions and you have to manage that so that you get the, the good public good objective of dealing with the environment, improving biodiversity, reducing emissions, but you don't cause unnecessary harm to a vital trading system, which because it is free and, and, and open, provides scope for moving technology and innovation and, and all the, 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 the human capital we need uh, to solve the problem on a global basis. That's a major challenge for, for our work uh, in, the, in the near future, to get that balance right between trade and environment. Mm, yeah, no, it's such a such an interesting topic. Um, so, um, very conscious of time, I think this will have to be. We'll, I'll put some questions to you, and if you want to say any sort of concluding remarks, and if you can ideally keep it to about a minute each, that would be ideal. Um, so, firstly, if I can come to you, then the High Commissioner. Um, one of the questions we've had is around COVID and the impact of COVID on on environmental diplomacy. Do you, are you confident that we're able to keep this issue at the top of the agenda when so many countries are obviously still dealing with desperate um, public health and economic crises as a result of COVID? Well, I think, yes, uh, in the Maldives, uh, uh, you know, we depend on tourism, as you know, and with COVID, we had to close our borders from uh, March to July last year. And uh, from almost a middle income country, we went to a zero income country uh, overnight. However, we have used that opportunity to look at the ways that we can uh, restructure our economy and with a climate uh, uh, lens. So I, I think, you know, you have to look at these things as opportunities rather than in, with desperation. So I, I think that's my answer to that. Jane, thank you very much. Um, Harry, if I can now come to you. Um, one of the questions we've had is, is, is a, from a Conservative candidate, someone who's um, a Senate supporter, wanting to know how best we can engage, um, you know, people that maybe aren't, uh, you know, in, involved in these um, very high level UN goals um, and make this a sort of agenda that's um, real and practical to people in their day to day lives. I mean, obviously, as a constituency MP, this is something I give a lot of thought to and I'm um, holding an event uh, later in the year in the run up to COP to highlight some of the businesses in the constituency that are adapting and going to showcase their journey to net zero. Also doing outreach to schools, because as we heard from uh, Stanley and other pan panelists, a voice of young people is really powerful in this area. And so trying to amplify those voices and come up with an overall ask from the constituency that will go to the COP president in advance of the COP is the way that I'm trying to channel our, channel stuff on the ground um, into this you know, massive international conference. Um, but I do think that um, you, you know, still uh, there are a range of ways in which um, people want to do more, um, but are finding it quite challenging from a practical point of view to do more. And so I think there we just need to kind of consistency in terms of some of the, the pricing signals that are coming both through the tax system, um, um, but through the economy more generally. And, um, uh, you know, every day those incremental changes can be made. Right. Thank you. Harris. Um, Stanley, we've had a question in about um, carbon taxes and carbon pricing and, and their importance. Do you think that is the, the, the bulk of the solution? Um, if we can get agreement to kind of raise carbon taxes and carbon pricing, um, we'll go a long way to solving this. I think we would go. Oh, I am on, I'm on, on message already. We would go a long way to solving it. I also agree with what James, James said. It's not, it's not a straightforward issue, but it actually has to happen <clears throat> and you would make huge progress by having i think what the eu is doing now is is, is extremely exciting and interesting and um, i very much hope that 
the UK joins in, and I hope that when they go to Carbis Bay later this year, they have time to progress this one. This is one, one thing which doesn't require international agreement. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much, Stanley. Um, and James, if I can come to you, um, one question I had is, what would you like to see come out of the, the Biden Leaders' Summit today on climate? Mm. What are you hoping to see? Well, I'm sure it's obvious to everybody that it makes a massive difference to have the US as a full supporter of this international negotiation and ready to do things with, with the powers that they have within their own borders to fundamentally reshape global markets in the solutions to, to, to the climate change problem. It's a, it's a huge shift uh, and it changes the geopolitics everywhere. Uh, others will rise to the, the challenge of the Biden administration without, without question today. So I'm hoping that, one, they set new and much more ambitious domestic targets for themselves. Two, I think I would like to see them be very strong advocates for carbon pricing across borders, figuring out how to do that effectively with other countries. Three, I'd like to see some very particular initiatives emerge, some that I'm hoping will do on nature. Uh, but some of that is to diplomatic uh, negotiations that will have to be had with forest countries, but I'd like to see it go beyond that to other natural systems that need valuation and protection and investment in. And finally, I'd like to see how the interaction between the US and China uh, produces uh, a higher level of cooperation between them, even while they compete fiercely at, on both political and economic grounds, uh, it's got to be possible for those two great powers to find ways of working together on this issue. And maybe that helps them keep the peace uh, on these other matters of conflict that can't be looked away from. Mm, yes, and you've just reminded me that we've not yet talked about China <laughs> in this yeah. whole number, which I think goes to show that an hour is not long enough to talk about this topic. Unfortunately, yeah, we are at the end of the webinar, so um, I'd like to thank everyone who's listened, and obviously to our, to our excellent speakers for um, for contributing your your insights and expertise. Um, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, just a couple of quick plugs before we go. Um, first is to say that we're obviously doing a lot of work on on COP26 and international climate policy this year, trying to bring conservatives together around market solutions, more ambition on, on climate change. So if you want to find out more about that, do get in touch with my colleagues John and Lois. Um, if, <coughs> like to hear. Um, we also have another webinar coming up again with an international focus and this time we'll be focusing in specifically on the, the nature um, summit that's being hosted okay. in Kunming um, and we might get a, a cameo from our SEN international ambassador at that as well we hope. Um, so please do watch out for that, it's going to be on the 21st of May. Um, but yes, finally just want to thank everyone again for, for joining and uh, yeah, hope you found an interesting discussion and enjoy the rest of your Earth Day and let's hope we get a, a good outcome from um, the Biden summit later today. Thank you.